The next topic that we're going to address is, is a huge one in cybersecurity, and that's the supply chain. It comes up time and again. It's come up in some of our earlier sessions today. What do you do as a large company with a large sprawling supply chain? How do you make sure your suppliers are cyber secure? If you're a supplier to large companies, how do you make sure that your large company partners regard you as secure? To give us a perspective on this, I'd now, now, now like to welcome up Nemi George from Pacific Dental Services and Kimberly Johnson from the Wall Street Journal. Oops. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Nemi, for joining us. Thank you. Um, so kind of set the stage here. You have a really interesting position at uh, Pacific Dental Services. Tell me kind of what the, the company does, and then we can kind of get into how you come at this topic of supply chain security. Yeah, so uh, Pacific Dental Services is a dental support organization. Um, we act effectively as a supplier of services to dental offices, uh, dental organizations. We're currently at about 807 in 22 states, and the idea is that a dentist goes into work and they do dentistry, and we provide everything else, from the name on the door all the way to the medical equipment that they have to use day to day. They just turn up and hopefully everything works. So that's what we do. Right. So in that sense, you are a supplier, but also other companies are supplying you with equipment and software and things that you then um, sell or lease out to, to others. Yeah. So how do you choose, since there's so much onus is on your firm, how do you as a CISO choose who to do business with? How do you choose a supplier? I think there is the ideal answer and then there's the, the answer that we all have to face every day. You know, you want to go for the best, you want to go for the, the market leaders, you want to go for the most secure and, and all of that, but ultimately the business wants to push you towards the, the cheapest, the um, more readily available. And so my job is really balancing those two extremes. Um, whoever is able to offer the best service versus some of the, the, the speed, the agility, the costs uh, that the business sometimes tends to be more interested in. Um, to do that, we have to set, uh, set up a, a series of um, frameworks. We, uh, the last speaker talked about a minimum um, security baselines. Um, we have pretty much the same thing. We call them uh, call ours MTSB, so minimum technology security baselines. And so as part of that contraction process, as part of the onboarding of new vendors, they go through a very rigorous assessment, um, slightly split into three buckets. Uh, the first is around capability. Um, obviously, the the supplier has got to be able to do what they are meant to do in terms of delivering value to the business. The second is really around data security, and that's where my team comes in. And also with some of the regulations coming out, there's also a privacy assessment, which in some cases could be wrapped into security, but it focuses a little bit more on the consumer rights rather than on the technology um, or whatever the service may be in that case. So how many questions, the, the first step, we talked about this earlier, it's about a dozen questions, and if the company doesn't score high on that, there's a, another, a deeper level assessment. Yeah. Um, you, can you talk about that a bit? Oh yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that we've tried to do with security is make sure that we don't have this sledgehammer to crack a nut approach. You know, there are not a lot of people that like security folks, and I kind of had to accept that very early on in my career. And a lot of times, with good reason, you know, you have um, an influencer, for instance, um, that's now famous, apparently. The amount of influencer contracts that I've had to review, if that is folks who go talk favorably about you and YouTube and Facebook and all that. Uh, if you have someone like that, you're not going to send them a long security requirements document that you know, requires the SOC 2 reports and the last time they had a pen test and all that. And it sounds ridiculous to even suggest it, but a lot of security organizations do that. They have this standard war and peace that everyone has to go through. So the first thing we've done is to make sure we understand, if, is there a risk? 
you know, and if there isn't one, then let's not waste time, let's move things on. So we started off with about nine questions, the very basic questions. Uh, what's the information being um, held um, about us or our customers? Um, do you store that information? Is that information held on our systems? Uh, I'm not going to go through all the nine of them, but one of the key things we do ask is do you have the ability to change that data? Because it's amazing how many suppliers we have that have full admin domain access to our environments. They, in some cases, are custodians of our customers' information and have the rights to edit, change the integrity of that information with no checks and balances from us as the as a customer. So we do that. And if through that process uh, you score, there's a very simple assessment, low, medium, or high, and we do that based on CIA, so your confidentiality, integrity, and availability, if you score a medium on any of those, that then triggers a subsequent assessment, which goes into a little bit more detail, um, and it's also structured based on the type of service you're providing. So for instance, there's a section that will focus on infrastructure providers versus device providers versus providers that provide software that sits in the cloud. So those are the options, and we kind of dig as deep as we need to, but making sure that we are cognizant of the risk right. that it poses. So if it's a high risk and they go through, it's about, what, 80 questions you said yeah. on your high risk questionnaire, do, do companies fail and yep. they just don't do business with them? or? How do you manage that when, particularly in the, the field of dentistry, there might be only one company making a certain kind of machine yeah. or, or something? How do you handle that? I think the, um, the, the key thing, and I always somehow weave this into everything that I say, is that the security departments can't be that department of no. Because a lot of times we're so quick to wield out power and tell people, no, you know, you can't do this. So there are times when, um, you know, vendors don't perform as well as they should. And depending on the level of risk, we will make recommendations to our organization to, um, you know, maybe put in additional controls, and those controls may be that they increase the level of insurance coverage. In other cases, it may well be that we segregate what they do or sort of put an air gap between that and the rest of our organization. But there are order practical things like you give them a timeline, you know, and this is where I also caution organizations to make sure they follow through. So you may have a, a taking a practical example, you may have a technology provider that has perhaps failed their last penetration test, or they have a number of critical vulnerabilities that have not been remediated. That's not necessarily a showstopper. But if you agree in line with your policy, if you can you know, win that argument, in some cases it will be in line with their policy, they may say they, they fix, say, critical vulnerabilities in 60 days. The key is to come back 60 days later and actually check. And you then need to have a process internally that says if there is evidence that they're not willing or there's no you know, evidence to the fact that they are actually trying to address those concerns, then what do you do? And that may well be that you, in our case, rather than signing a three-year contract or a five-year contract, we sign a one-year contract with those vendors. And that's a bit of an incentive to say, if you want us to renew for you know, the second year or take on more services, then you have to address those concerns. Right. And so the, it's key to follow up because it's really easy to put something in the contract, yeah. but it, the onus is also on you as a, a buyer of that good or mm -hmm. service to follow up and to yeah. ensure and to audit and to make sure that they've actually followed through on that. Yeah. Is that where one of the biggest gaps I would say that's a significant gap. I mean, we spend a lot of time doing contracts and outside of perhaps the legal people in here, I'm sure no one else likes to read contracts. And as soon as, they're, as, soon as the red lines are done and all the revisions are done, they, it gets stored somewhere. And frankly, no one ever looks at it again. And that's because looking at contracts, breaking out all of the, the arrangements and the um, you know, clauses and the you know, all the thing, little things, it's, it's a tough job. And a lot of times, security may sit within IT in the organization. And frankly, IT folks don't have the discipline, I hate to say, to go back, 
nine months later and you know say, hey, you know, we said we we're going to come audit you. They don't do that. And the legal folks are usually inundated by the next um, 20, 30 suppliers that the organization is looking to bring on board. Uh, now, there's so many ways you can do this. You can go all the way to implementing a GRC solution. A lot of them have um, modules what is, what is for a GRC? Uh, so governance, risk, and compliance. Right. Or you can just get a vendor management solution. Those are very effective. Or you could go the other way and just use simple solutions like Smartsheets, for instance, which is essentially Excel on the web. And you can do workflows, and you can put in reminders, and you can do all those things that allow you to at least keep yourself um, on target or on task to go back and check. Um, one last thing to say about that is avoid, where possible, using individual names, because people move on. and. A lot of those systems are not intelligent enough to tell you that they sent the reminder for that audit to Mr. X, who is no longer there. So use um, you know, distribution lists and mailboxes where possible so you don't have that problem. Right. So on the flip side of that, as a supplier to companies, do you, does your group behave as if it is going to be audited every 8 to 12 months or 12 to 24 months, and do you do you act as if the, your, the company you're supplying to is going to check up on you? Absolutely. I mean, going back to the, the title of this talk, how do you keep your, your, your vendors, your customers happy? Um, absolutely. In my case, um, we don't have a choice. Like I said, we're at 807 dental offices in 22 states. Every single one of those has the right to ask questions that may be uncomfortable for us if we haven't done our homework. Um, add to that the regulatory frameworks that govern dentistry and the, the wider um, business of um, healthcare. And so you have to act with the expectation that you're being audited. And um, ultimately, um, if you don't, I mean, again, going back to the, the last speaker, he talked about patching and things like asset management, knowing where your assets are, knowing what's important to you. If you don't have a good grasp of on those things, then um, a very simple request like um, we're in California to take um, the California Privacy, uh, Consumer Privacy Act, where a customer may exercise their rights to ask what information you hold about them. Let's just pause on that for a second. Sounds really, really basic. What information do you hold about me? A lot of organizations cannot answer that question, and you have so much data moving around your infrastructure, around your ecosystem. If you don't have the ability to track and you don't, you don't um, run your business with the expectation that you can get one of these requests, one of these audits, one of the, or just have an incident and not have the ability to respond to it, then uh, you're setting yourself up for failure, I think. So what's the, what's the biggest challenge that either that people in the supply, companies in the supply chain face. And you know, before, you even, before we even get to that, I mean, let's kind of take a step back and define supply chain. I think when we talk about vendors, it's very clear at times that we're talking about technology, software, hardware. Um, but a supplier can be something that's a little bit more traditional. However, the way we're doing business now is all digital in many instances. So how do you define a supplier? I would say uh, a supplier is anyone and everyone that you rely on to deliver a service uh, to you or your customers that is outside of your immediate organization. And that includes the third and fourth parties that your immediate suppliers contract to. Because a lot of times we don't think about those, but in today's, in today's market, the, it's, it's very global, it's very mobile. The services that you provide just move around the globe based on cost. And unfortunately, ease of doing business, which usually means less regulations, less oversight, and as such, the, the more your supplier chain grows, it stands to interpret it as the, the less security you have or the less control you're able to exert on that supply chain. And so um, you made a point about the digital um, marketplace, if you like. We're in an increasingly digital world. But when I look at supply chain, I look at everything. I look at, we're in a healthcare organization. 
you can put in all the controls in the world and at what six seven o'clock my staff leave and the the cleaners come in or the maintenance crews come in and when i joined my organization for instance we had lock boxes outside that had keys master keys to the whole business and because the office manager has just finished a 10 hour shift and doesn't want to stay the extra four hours for the maintenance crew to come in those keys are left accessible to them some of those codes haven't been changed in or had not been changed at the time in three four five years and so when you think of your supply chain don't always think the big cyber security vendors or technology vendors think about everyone think about leaving your home to someone else to come in to do whatever or provide whatever service that is and what level of risk you are able to accept or tolerate um, that's essentially the way i look at it right and so how do you avoid as a as a supplier to not be collateral damage and how do you even begin to start thinking about well i could be threatened because someone adjacent to me in some way is threatened and then I have to answer to my customers? I think there are two ways to look at that. I'll look at it first from a, as a customer. Especially today in the digital space, we, everyone is going you know, to the cloud, everyone is providing services to everybody else. Uh, you may just be, the, the example I use is you may be Susie's Cakes down the corner and you feel that there's no one else to get you. Well, if you're hosted, if you are your service has been provided by a supplier who has a few, you know, tier one customers. Um, it stands to reason that they may target them because of the other clientele they have, and then you are just collateral damage because you're hosted in the same platform and the same tenant and the same environment as someone else is. Now, that's a risk that you have to think about. Obviously, the cost of having a standalone infrastructure versus a shared multi-tenant infrastructure may be significant for your business. Um, but it, it just doesn't stop at um, you know, hosting. A few years ago, we had a dying DNS um, um, outage that affected, what, 40-ish percent of the world's infrastructure. Um, no one was thinking about that when you know, they were choosing Dyn DNS as their, as their provider. So collateral damage is always a risk, um, especially because of the costs, otherwise if not you know, of going um, in the opposite direction. But that's a, a cost that you have to, a balance that you, you have to decide, not from an IT standpoint, but as a business, um, you have to make that decision. Absolutely, thank you. And I think we're gonna go to questions now. Let's see, see what questions we have out there from the audience for Nemi. Any hands up that I'm missing? Up at the back there. Thanks. So Nemi, you had some good rules of engagement for how you do your uh, vendor audits, but a lot of the vendors are gonna use subcontractors for a majority of their work. So do you audit their vendor auditing processes or do you try to push down to their subcontractors? How do you make sure it goes all the way downhill? Um, the first thing I do is I understand who those subcontractors are. Um, and that's very important to understand how, you know, how far that web goes. Once you've established that, um, now this is where you need a lawyer sometimes because in some cases, the contracts will allow you push down certain controls to those subcontract, uh, subcontractors. In other cases, that may not be the case. Um, what you have to really, really push on is you providing them what your minimum standards are and have some ability to audit that. Now, gone are the days when you have the right to audit and you show up at a data center or a customer's premise and perform audits. So you may need to agree, based on the service they're providing to you, what key indicators of compromise, key performance indicators are, and in some cases, maybe agree to a regular cadence. Uh, what I've done when I manage suppliers is, depending on the risk of the suppliers, agree on a regular cadence that may be every six months or every year. These are the set of information and you know, data points that I want you to provide me that give me a sense of assurance 
that um, you know, this is, uh, you're providing the service to the level that I want. Uh, and if you're ever gonna do that or really weigh in on the suppliers, do that prior to signing, because even down to the, the subcontractors, they will allow you some level of access if they really want your business. Um, that's, but I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah. Other questions for Nemi? Any other hands out there? What about uh, training? Do you ever consider training any of your suppliers, bringing them into your own programs? Yeah, we do. Um, that's, um, we do a few things when it comes to training. One is we have a, a very basic security program simply called Information Security and You. And if you have any access whatsoever to our um, information, then you're required as part of the legal process to complete the training or you can send us evidence of an equivalent level training that you've done within the organization that meets our requirements. And then if you send in people on site, then they're required to do a training as well. So we do that, and for some of the suppliers that um, we have a more um, established relationship with, we also include them in some of our internal security campaigns, phishing awareness programs, and, and things like that. We're about out of time, so I'd like to thank Nemi and thank Kim Kimberly.